indexing the ridiculous Oh, hi there. It seems that you're having a difficult time searching. Oh, hi. Good day, ma'am. Uh, yes, I'm actually having a hard time finding some information on indexing and abstracting. Sure, I'll find that out for you. Is there any specific topic you're looking for regarding the subject? Um, I've already got some sources on the background of indexing and abstracting, and also some sources on indexing in the 20th century. But now I'm actually, I can't find any materials regarding the rise of indexing and abstracting services. Okay, what have you found so far? As I don't want to give you something that you already have. I've been searching in the OPAC and I can't really find anything. So I really got nothing, ma'am. No worries. We have resources regarding your information need. That's great. Follow me, please. The Rise of Indexing and Abstracting Services Did you know a common misperception in today's era of widely available information of every type is that there is no longer any need for abstracting and indexing services. But that is not the case. Abstracting and indexing services still have a valuable role to play. The world is now full of information explosion. In libraries, a process of uniquely identifying items of bibliographic information is being applied. With the exception of the public catalog, the most used devices for bibliographic control in the library are the indexing and abstracting services. In most modern-day libraries, electronic indexes and abstracts are frontline tools. Thousands of databases are available, and sophisticated search options have been developed for rapid access. Indexing and abstracting services are known as secondary services. Why secondary services? Why can't they be primary services or main services? Indexing and abstracting services are known as secondary devices or secondary services because their topic is not a new knowledge in a subject area, but only a guide to the basic or primary sources. Now, hold on! Where did indexing and abstracting originate from? Where did these two services even come from? Generally, these operations originate from five general sections of society. These are business and industry, learned societies and professional organizations, institutional establishments, government, and for profit commercial organizations. First is the business and industry. The primary interest of business and industry is the creation and marketing of products. The indexes and abstracts produced in this field are part of the business or company's informational support activity. Internal operational reports and reports acquired from external sources need bibliographic control. This vital material can be utilized effectively only if it can be indexed and abstracted. The concern of business and industry is not for information distribution to the general public, but for their own business operations. The second are the learned societies and professional organizations. The goal of learned societies and professional organizations is to give service to their members 
and to promote knowledge advancement in their areas. These societies and organizations often issue a substantial number of primary publications and many also offer indexing and abstracting services, both to their own publications and to the general literature in the field. The third are the institutional establishments. Institutional establishments include such organizations as museums, private non-profit research groups, and universities. Their overall portion of indexes and abstracts is relatively small, but by no means unimportant. The fourth is the government. Government agencies contribute considerably more, producing indexes and abstracts to a myriad of subject areas. The U.S. federal government is the world's largest publisher, and its information output is both formidable and complex. Now the last general section of society are the commercial organizations. Now I'm sure that when you hear the word commercial, what comes to your mind is money. It's about maximizing your products, your services, and your assets in the organization. Now, commercial organizations have as their objective the making of a profit by creating indexes and abstracts. Now, contrary to what might be presumed, commercial operators produce a relatively small portion of the total output. Now, the word indexing service is today mostly used for computer programs but may also cover services providing back-of-the-book indexes, journal indexes, and so much more. Now, we have already covered this in the previous lessons or reports. Now, most of indexing and abstracting service is aimed at the journal literature that presently is the most extensive source of validated and reliable information. No coverage ranges from broad and general areas to highly specialized topics. However, much more than journals are covered. The services also covers index and abstract books, reports, pamphlets, newspapers, government documents, and even materials in collections such as plays and poems. Now, the basic purpose of an index and abstract is the efficient and effective access to information. The indexing and abstracting services in this country and around the world is an outstanding tribute to the information profession and also to us, future information professionals. these resources are really helpful. I'm sure that these can really benefit me a lot in my studies. I'm glad to hear that. Would those resources be enough for you to get started? Hmm. Um, now that I'm on it, I'm actually a little bit curious or I want to delve a bit deeper into indexing and abstracting, especially on what indexes and abstracts has been produced or created. Mm -hmm, I see. Sure, I can help you with that. Is there any specific period you're looking for or are you looking for current examples? I actually want to start off with some historical examples of indexes and abstracts. By historical examples, do you mean those also in the Middle Ages? Yes, that could be possible. Okay, we will have that information ready for you. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm really glad that you have everything that I need here. We are glad to help. Come along with me again, please. Many examples of historically important indexes and abstracts exist from antiquity through the Middle Ages and into the 21st century. Now, just to give an idea of some of these works, here is a brief list. Now, these were selected 
because they represent landmarks in indexing and abstracting. Some historically notable indexes and abstracts. The Amduat. The Amduat is a funerary text that recorded a trip by Ra, the Egyptian sun god, through the underworld. A copy of the text of the Amduat can be found at www.sacredtexts.com. Arts and Humanities Citation Index. Thomson Reuters indexes current and retrospective bibliographic information from nearly 2,697 journals across 55 social science disciplines as well as selected items from 3,500 of the world's leading scientific and technical journals, retrospective to 1900s. These can be accessed at thomsonreuters.com or clarivate.com currently. Chemical Abstracts Published with the American Chemical Society, this abstract is the world's leading source of chemical information. More than 224,000 retrospective records are available for this tool. This can be found at cassie.cas.org. Crudence Concordance this was first published as a complete concordance to the Holy Scriptures in 1737 by Alexander Cruden and has been in print since that time. It is currently available through various publishers. In 2011, the University of California Libraries published a new edition. Historically, one of the greatest bibliographic events in medical librarianship occurred when the Library of the Surgeon's General's Office began the systematic indexing of medical literature. The library began two indexes in the 1870s, the Index Medicus and the Index Catalog of the Library. The former was the forerunner of Medline. The Surgeon General's Office Library became the National Library of Medicine. The National Library of Medicine has always been a world leader in indexing and basic research related to indexing. Since its inception, the NLM has focused on medical literature indexing and over the years has engaged many indexers in the phenomenal task of providing bibliographic access to the ever-expanding medical literature. This was quite a task, and it laid the groundwork for the great databases that followed, and continues on as internet becomes accessible tools for the health sciences literature. In the 1880s, John Shaw Billings, a towering figure in the history of the NLM, led the creation of the Index Medicus, which is a subject or author guide to the medical literature first published in 1879. This was a formidable undertaking by human labor without computers. The Index Medicus continued through the development of Medline and subsequent databases and indexes. The National Library of Medicine also published Index Medicus or Cumulated Index Medicus and the abridged Index Medicus from 1970 to 1997. Library Literature and Information Science Full Text This is the full text of articles from over 155 journals going back to 1997. Journal Discovon The Journal Discovon established by Denise de Salio, is the earliest academic journal published in Europe. 
Micropedia to the 15th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The purpose of this index is to classify the bulk of the Britannica's contents under a topical scheme rather than the traditional alphabetical arrangement, with the objective of providing the user with a guide to the Britannica and as a tool for the systematic study of a topic and its related aspects of interest. Monats Extracte Monats Extracte is the first German abstract journal published in 1703. Pools Index to Periodical Literature This was the first systematic article level index to the subject matter of 19th century periodicals. The first edition was published in six volumes between 1882 and 1908. Actually, the index began in 1848 as the project of Yale student, William Frederick Poole. By the time the final volume was released in 1908, the index had covered 482,000 articles and 378,000 subjects. This index can be viewed at archive.org The Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature In the early 1800s, periodical publications exploded and clearly scholars needed access to information across the journal literature, not just to individual titles. William Frederick Poole in 1853, published an index to the contents of many journals, thus establishing the modern practice of publishing a single index for numerous periodicals, which went through a number of evolutions. Poole graduated from Yale in 1849. As a student librarian, Poole became aware of the need for finding out what sets of periodicals contained so he set out to make an index. His first edition of Index to Periodicals was published in 1853. The importance of this event to the development of indexing cannot be overstated. According to Poole's obituary, the first index contained 154 pages of octavo, the second 521 pages. The third edition of the index appeared in 1882 and contained 1,469 pages royal octavo. This was prepared with the cooperation of the American Library Association and the Library Association of Great Britain. The obituary also said that he made librarianship known as a profession. In 1900s, H. W. Wilson published its first edition of the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, a successor to Poole's work. This index was especially notable for the emphasis it placed on subject access and good cross-referring. Each article in a periodical was indexed under its author and its specific subject. Numerous cross-references linked up each subject with related subjects and with aspects of the subject. New York Times Index This is a historically important index because it served as a role model for newspaper indexes. This index began in 1851 and has been published continuously. Over the years, it has become a landmark example of a newspaper index. Is a citation index similar to indexing? A citation index is a different approach to indexing. The indexes consist of a list of articles with a sublist under each article of subsequently published papers that cite the articles. In other words, 
given a particular paper, a citation index shows who cited that paper at a later point in time. Shepard's citations gives accounts of legal decisions and later citations. This is a fundamental searching tool for the law profession because of its reliance on precedent. Citation indexing, however, is relatively new as a general reference tool. That will be all for my report. Thank you! If you have any questions or clarifications, please feel free to ask me.